It's a great pleasure to have Professor Jess Eisert from Berlin uh, with us today in the uh, fourth or fifth talk in this series. Um, I don't think he needs a much of an introduction. I uh, just want to say it's great to see you again. Uh, we go back a long time from the Imperial College times, almost 20 years ago. Your postdoc, I was a student at that time. Uh, many things have happened since then. <laughs> and uh, it's great to see you virtually again. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, yes, we're talking about rigorous statements on near term quantum computing. So, Jens, the floor is yours. Thanks so very much. That's correct. Thanks to Dimitris for the, the kind invitation, and thanks for all the effort and um, sweat of um, setting up this wonderful um, seminar uh, series in these awkward times. I hope you're all um, healthy and um, and well. And if, if I may say so, it does seem to me that the community is um, doing rather well. And maybe there's a bit of a positive lesson to be learned from all this. At the end of the day, let's see um, how, how, how this goes. Anyway, so near-term quantum computing. So quantum computing with a relatively small, the relatively noisy and warm quantum computers that we have today. This is a fresh and exciting feat of research that's very difficult to deny and that's receiving a lot of attention these days uh, for good reasons, I'm tempted to say. And at the same time, the field is a bit in a kind of a gold rush state. I hope this is a fair thing to say where people get excited and, and um, run around and find gold nuggets every once in a while. But then it's not so easy to get a handle on it and see what's really on plate in this largely Heuristic, heuristically driven field and what precise speedups would be available at the end of the day and what one can expect in this, in, in this sense. So in this talk, we will not attempt to give a full answer to those questions, even though I would love to. That's the bad news. The good news is that even in this heuristically driven field, one can say actually quite a few things um, rigorously, and this is the program that we have on the plate today, and that's what we, what this talk will be, will be about. Now, of course, the guiding vision in all this is the compelling idea of building like large-scale, full Monty, fault-tolerant quantum computers that would solve some problems in NP in polynomial time, like Shor's factoring algorithm and other sister algorithms of hidden subgroup problems, being the most uh, prominent examples. Uh, there. It's a truly a compelling idea. Alas, very few people expect this to be available in any time as soon. What we do have at present are like small, noisy, warm and wet, well, maybe not wet, but smallish quantum computers um, that are not, uh, not fault tolerant in, 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 in any. Um, in we used to have wet as well, like the end of Mar, but not anymore. That's so it's. That's uh, also um, indeed. So, but that's still an exciting affair. So we'd like to see things rather, um, the, 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 the glass rather half full than half empty. And we've seen in recent years a number of protagonists, mostly from the US industrial landscape, walking out and actually going into labs and realizing small scale quantum computers. We know the um, IBM 53 qubit machine, um, there is the 53 Google um, computer, Rigetti is um, working with superconducting qubits and maybe slightly more in stealth mode, the um, photonic integrated optical approach that um, PsyQuantum uh, is, is, is pursuing. Um, these are highly exciting endeavors. I, I work a lot with, with Google. Last night's talk with them on our Hamiltonian learning project I missed because as I said, I'm just in a, in a, in a hospital and <laughs> giving this talk a bit impromptu, Never mind. These are highly um, exciting endeavors. And even though these devices may be small and, and, and noisy, one must be aware of the fact that such devices were in the realm of science fiction not very long ago. It's an extremely exciting um, state of affairs. Now, given that these guys are small, it's very wise to make the best use of this precious resource and put as much as possible of all the elaborate 
um, computation into the classical realm and have a classical computer do most of the show and have a kind of quantum, a small scale quantum computer in the center that is, has controlled parameters in one way or the other. One performs measurements and then this classical control algorithm would make use of these data, would update the control parameters and would feed that back into the system and one could iterate this setting in many rounds and think in this end of a classical quantum hybrid algorithm where most of the work is actually being done by, by the classical algorithm and not so much the quantum algorithm that sits in, in the center. And these ideas have heuristically a very encouraging performance. The most known one and maybe also the simplest would be the various readings of, of so-called variational quantum eigensolvers where one basically minimizes a Hamiltonian like a, a fictitious or a real Hamiltonian over a variational set of states that's governed by these control knobs. There's a kind of variational family of states and kind of wants to find the minimum over this variational set upon tuning the parameters in the right fashion. And it should be clear that this has a number of interesting applications, say in quantum chemistry, where one could have, say, the Hamiltonian of the chemistry problem directly encoded or maybe to a lesser extent also in uh, material science, again, with heuristically very encouraging performance. A slightly more sophisticated way of a classical quantum hybrid algorithm would be one where one not so much aims at solving, say, a physics -y or, or chemistry-like problem, but rather would like to find a good approximation of some combinatorical optimization uh, problem like, like max cut or so, where one, where the goal is to determine a, an approximate op optimum of a Boolean objective function by um, varying um, the, the input. And the aim is to find a good, say, approximation ratio. These are like NP-hard problems often, but one can still aim to kind of find an approximate solution in, 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 in this sense. And the upshot is that in the quantum implementation, one would basically encode the objective function into some Hamiltonian, like the, the encoding Hamiltonian, that one would run for some time and would kick the system out of the basis with intermediate kicks along the way and have multiple rounds of that fashion where all these parameters of the problem would be controlled parameters of the problem going to be varied upon in this variational um, sense. And this, again, um, gives rise to um, a very good heuristic performance. It's very well understood at the single layer level. That's um, a quite simple setting. It's very deeply understood, but the expressive power is also not so much. It's much less understood beyond the single layer. That's the interesting regime. There's interesting concentration of measure ideas walking around. Heuristically, there's a growing body of evidence that this gives rise to a, a meaningful and interesting scheme um, after all. So these settings like VQE, QAWA, these quantum approximate optimization algorithms, as they are called, they have heuristically a very encouraging performance. And that's an extremely interesting and um, exciting state of affairs. And still, if one aims at putting this onto a more like systematic fashion, would like to be more forward looking and think like what's really on the plate in the near term, it would like to, it would be nice to have some sort of meaningful answer to some variant of a question of the type. Now this starts again. This is funny because we are saying we are so so much um, Zoom experts. <laughs> yes. Uh, Actually, well, yeah. you never know. Um, it's okay. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm also teaching electronically. It's absolutely unbelievable how many things can go wrong. Well, yeah. It's unbelievable. True. I mean, each time there's some uh, WebEx server not working, some yeah, yeah. iPad not talking to another thing. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Like every time there's something. Classical computing still has lots of problems. There's also no incentive of companies that are funny, but since I'm recorded, I'm not commenting. Anyway, 
um, the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is to make systematic progress of some kind, it would be nice to have some answer to some variant of the question whether there's hope to say something rigorous on the performance of near-term quantum computers. Of course, what we really want is we want to have some deep insight, some theorem on a quantum algorithm without quantum error correction that has um, some speed up over classical computers with a recovery guarantee and, and all the epsilons and deltas fleshed out. This is what we would love to have. Alas, I cannot offer this today. Um, I'm very sorry, even though I would love to. But what would still make sense is to identify key components of near-term quantum computing, like zoom in and very carefully look at these key components and try to understand them as comprehensively, quantitatively, and rigorously as one can to then hope by connecting these dots, one can get a more comprehensive picture um, of near-term computing coming out at the end of the day. We call this in the group sometimes proof pockets of really identifying key components of near-term quantum computers that are being used that are kind of like exploited in near-term computing to say as much as one can about them again in the hope that by connecting the dots there is a picture emerging to make progress to the next level away from a, a purely heuristic understanding of the field and this is kind of what's at stake in the rest of the talk and we will have a look at three proof pockets of this and I will also not make use of your patience too long. It will not, such, not be such a long talk, so um, there should be time for questions and whatever. It, it will be a rather um, short, short talk. So there's three proof pockets. The first two on really sh small quantum circuits and the possibility of variationally finding good answers with these circuits. Whereas the third proof pocket is not so much on small circuits, or, well, it is on small circuits, but it's a kind of small, so it's, maybe it's a very shallow circuit. The way you squeeze and you want to have like a, a, a not very deep circuit or even a unit depth circuit and ask, can you do anything with a unit depth circuit? And like, what's the computational power of short or even unit depth quantum circuits after all? Can you even think of a quantum advantage or the unfavorable quantum supremacy as people used to say on unit depth quantum circuits. And that's kind of the last proof pocket we will meditate on. Good, that's the agenda for the, for the rest of the talk. So the first one is on stochastic gradient descent for hybrid classical quantum computing, or we jokingly call this also quantum doubly stochastic gradient descent for reasons that will come, become later, or actually will become clear pretty much in, 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 in a second. Now, we have all these, these dudes, these variational algorithms, in one way or the other, where there's the, the quantum part sitting in the center, leave all these knobs to control the, the, the problem in the variational quantum eigensolver sense, in the Quawa sense, in readings of quantum machine learning, there's many, and every day a growing number of flavors of this type where however in any of these sense there will be some loss function that governs what you want to achieve in one way or the other that needs to be optimized in the setting and well one would go into the lab there's all these control parameters and one would like to find some meaningful rationale of choosing these control parameters to optimize to minimize the loss function at the end of the day. Now there's many ways of doing that. There's gradient free methods, but the consensus is that using the gradient is a good idea. I mean, there's other problems that the landscape may be very rugged and there's this um, barren plateau problem, but leaving this aside for a moment, the, the most powerful methods would be gradient based methods where one makes use of data from the control parameters that estimates the, the, the the gradient in one way and kind of tries to go downhill in this variational um, landscape. So how's this done? Well, it's quantum physics. One goes into the lab in Santa Barbara, in, in wherever, and takes data and um, estimates expectation values. 
and once one has enough expectation values together, one can estimate the, the gradient for the update and then change the variational parameters accordingly. This is great, but this is much more innocent looking than it is. I mean, estimating the gradient using expectation values, that's great, but one should not forget that an expectation value is in the abstraction of repeating the same measurement like many, many times. And in this setting here, you go into the lab and have to run the quantum circuit each time to then get an estimator for the expectation value at the end of the day. And this, depending on the setting, can be okay or extremely painful. We are collaborating with people in Heidelberg, for example, with called atomic systems, where like one shot, one data point would like take up to 20 seconds. And when you start talking to them about statistics and expectation values, they completely freak out for good reasons. They want to, I mean, this is not going anywhere. So, um, well, I mean, there's a kind of mild leverage coming from tricks like the so-called parameter shift rule, which is a cute idea that involves some symmetry that's present in many um, quantum circuits in that it satisfies a parameter shift rule of some type if the partial derivatives of the expectation values with respect to the control parameters can be seen as a linear combination of the same expectation value of slightly shifted parameters. And funny as this rule may see, seem, this is often present in systems and this also provides some um, healing, some leverage in this problem after, after all. There's a lot of activity in that sense also our paper that we put out like last week, elaborates on that. There's a beautiful paper by Banki and Crooks that also um, offers a, a more general parameter shift rule, which is um, interesting in, in, in this context. But that's not so much the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is you go into the lab and you have to repeat the same measurement many, many times to get expectation values to then make an update in the gradient and, 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 and move on. So ex estimation of expectation values by no means innocent but can be excessively costly so is there is there help um, available and that's the point of the first proof pocket um, and the stimulus of this is coming from a very basic idea namely that of a stochastic gradient method which is ubiquitous in machine learning to say the least i mean the well practical activity in machine learning can be seen as the theory of stochastic gradients in, in some way. Don't quote me on this. Oh, it's recorded, never mind. Um, um, so that it's kind of an, an, an update rule, making use of the gradient, but making use of a stochastic grade um, element in, in, the, in, in, the, in the gradient where like stochastic random variables are, are involved. And the advice given in our scheme is very, very simple indeed. It's basically, Go into the same lab, do the same thing you anyway do, but along this way, just measure what you can. Measure the, the guys you can, the, 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 the settings you can, measure them as many times you can, and make the best use of the data you acquire. That's the advice. I mean, experimentalists like to hear that type of advice. Don't think of expectation variables, just accumulate data and put the misery to the theories of making use of that data in a, in, in a good fashion. So specifically, you can do n-shot measurements. You have like your setting in the lab and instead of, instead of the abstraction of repeating this measurement infinitely many times and infinity is long, uh, you just measure this n times and you will not get the expectation value. Well, because you, you're not measuring infinitely many times, but you get an n-shot estimate. You get an unbiased estimator for the expectation value that would converge ultimately to this expectation. But you're not doing convergence. You just shoot into the air and get your n shot measurement where n can be a million or two or one, depending on your setting. You just take what you can. Now you take these kind of data, these n shot measurement data, um, and using those, you get an unbiased estimator for the partial derivatives of the expectation values with respect to the control norms of your problem. 
you get an unbiased estimator from that using the parameter shift rule that I just mentioned for the unbiased estimator of the cost function with respect to these um, control uh, variables with n, n k um, shots. And putting this together, one can find a stochastic gradient descent update that we dubbed doubly stochastic gradient descent because there's a stochastic component in this setting, but there's also a second stochastic component coming in because you do quantum measurements and quantum measurements are intrinsically random. So the, the, the second part of randomness is just the, the automatic randomness that you, that you get for free or have to get because you're just doing measurements and, and measurements have, have to be random and you're not making in pretty many of them just but a, a few shots of, of this. So the advice given is excessively simple. Go into the lab, don't do a new experiment, do the same experiment, do everything the same just send your Python code with data a bit earlier than, than, than before. Like, as I said last night, we just got a new uh, Python uh, sheet from Pedram who took data um, for the Hamiltonian learning project. It's exciting. It just means ask the same people for the same data, but just shorter files. So this gives rise to, to an algorithm that allows to estimate the gradient um, extremely economically. It's also an extremely simple idea for that matter. It was a kind of a low hanging fruit. As usual, the devil is in the detail. Um, so it's still a kind of 20 pages or so paper of working out how this all works in, in, in the different setting. It works relatively straightforwardly in this variation quantum eigen solver problem where it's reminiscent of ideas of um, digital Hamiltonian simulation ideas. There's anyway a quite deep connection between Hamiltonian simulation and this, this field, but never mind. The, um, the Quawa setting is way more intricate because you have the many rounds, which makes the, the problem uh, rather hairy, but we, 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 we solved it. And the paper also offer, offers a mean squared error quantum classifier problem in the quantum machine learning context where there's kind of nonlinear function um, coming, coming into play. And um, so this is the, 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 the algorithm the meta point of all this is that not only provide, does it provide an algorithm that, provide, that functions nicely heuristically and kind of works well in, in, in good and practical settings, but for each of them, for all these settings, VQE and Quawa and so on, we have a, a rigorous recovery guarantee, the, meaning we know that it will work in a very precise, precise fashion. So here's an example of this kind. Uh, um, where there's some technical assumptions on the, on the cost function. Clearly, there's the, the problem of a rugged landscape, so you can, in principle, get stuck in a barren plateau, but that's a different issue. Here's the issue of convergence to a good local, a good lo uh, local uh, minimum. So what one can show is that if one runs the, the, the machinery upon making use of T steps and two shots measurements in the setting, um, the estimate of the objective function will converge exponentially quickly to the cost function evaluated at the, at, the optimal, at the optimal point as a theorem. So one takes the data, the K shot, the, the T shot data, and one knows that this will necessarily, in this sense, exponentially quickly go to the, to the, to the right value. And this is nice to have in this kind of heuristically driven field. It's a very practical method but you know it will work and will, not, will work in a very kind of quantitative and, and precise sense. And that's a kind of a type of setting and, and type of statement that we much need in, in, in this field as, as, as I think. So this is kind of our, our theorem picture of, of, the, of the world of, of variation parameters. At the same time, it works very well in practice. We've checked many important settings to kind of bring this into contact with, with the practical world. We check this for variation quantum eigensolvers, quantum approximate optimization, or this kind of machine learning concept where you see that this works um, excessively well in practice. I mean, interestingly, even single shot measurement can be good enough. Like the Heidelberg people were super happy to hear this, that instead of running this 20 seconds machine for a thousand times, you run it once and, and, and do something about it. That is um, it's good news. And again, same type of data, same type of setting, but you equip a simpler prescription, which is a much stronger recovery guarantee, and you still get away with it. That's 
what what what's um, what, what what's happening. So the the lesson somehow of our first proof pocket is by overcoming the prejudice. That's what it is that one should estimate expectation values. They are fiction. They are very costly in the sense because you have to run the same circuit many many times. Just take a different advice. Go into the same lab. Shoot at something you can. Take fewer data. Maybe single shot data. N shot data. And you still get away from it with it. You get good update rules. You know how to change your parameters and you get significantly, sometimes by order of magnitudes, better method for finding variation updates in the near term case. But in the spirit of a proof pocket equipped with the full theorem that in, in what precise way it, it will work. It's kind of our kind of religious statement here that it's, uh, I think it's an interesting um, thing to have. So here with a nice disclaimer of, 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 of a proof, one would know that it's fiction to, to do what you think you should do, but you will get away much, much better by using the same data, but in a different fashion, which is the, the, the lesson of this first book. Okay, so this, I mean, also, I wish I should say, I mean, this is like um, just the tip of the iceberg and there's way more to be said and done about this. One can also use more structure of this gradient of this landscape, there's sparsity, there's low rankness. We're just working on this to do to, to more about this. Um, one can also kind of tweak this more into the practical realm. This is something that um, we just put out uh, last week on an idea of quantum computer aided design that also relates to an idea by Alan that came out on basically at the same time. Here we, that we use the methodology of this compelling idea of using a quantum computer to design quantum computers or here to design metrological um, states. It's kind of a cute idea. It's a bit like a, a robot designing a robot in this artificial intelligence explosion. You have like quantum computers designing quantum computers um, or more powerful quantum computers. Um, this is a bit of a joke, of course, but it is interesting to see that man can use variational methods very, in a very powerful fashion to design, say, probes and measurements in variational contexts or in metrological context. It's really hard to, to come up with, um, with otherwise. This was a small paper that we put out, but everybody's jumping on them. And I am speaking again to the, the Google people later, just after this talk, to, to see how this can be. How this can be. Good. First proof pocket. 28 minutes. I promise to be short, so I will keep the second two proof pockets um, shorter. So the first proof pocket was on, you have some guy in the, in the lab, you have variational parameters. Can you find some rationale of changing the parameters meaningfully so that the problem becomes better? The second proof pocket is about what you can achieve with these knobs in the first place. You change the knobs, what can you do with it? So what do short quantum circuits represent after all? That's the question of what you can do with them or more pedantically put, what's the expressive power of such circuits? Meaning, say you have control knobs, you ask, say what unitary gates can you represent by picking the control knobs appropriately, or if you put in a fiducial state at the be beginning of the, of the day, it's like a, some dummy state, what are the state vectors you can reach upon making suitable choices? I mean, that's a very important question. Say, when you think of Quava, you ask like, in certain rounds of Quava, how expressive are you? And what can you do? What can you reach with a finite number of um, steps of, the, of, of this kind? This is highly important. and. I hope um, I don't want to offend anyone. I, I, to my understanding, it's a it's a strangely understudied question, but not so much because it's not important, but because it's not so easy to come by with with tools. In machine learning, this is a very hot topic these days to look at expressive power of neural networks. It's a very much related question. Yeah, in fact, there's an even a mathematical um, over overlap here. So can one? It's very hard to come up with rigorous statements of that type, but it would be good to know, like. What can Quava do? What can variational quantum eigensolvers do? What can you anyway do? The, the heart of the matter is what can you do with short quantum circuits? So that's the more colloquial way of putting it. You have knobs, what can you do with them? And this is the second question you want to look at in a specific reading, but one, again, in the spirit of this talk, it's, I like to have like 
one spirit per talk. In the spirit of this talk, we would like to look at one concise setting, which is not the, the full picture, but where we can really basically say everything we want about this problem, like really hammer down a problem to, to, to the end to kind of see what, what happens in this, in this problem. And the, the point is to look at probability distributions captured by tensor networks that exploits the deep connection between tensor networks on the one hand and quantum circuits, short quantum circuits, as I will explain in a second, if this may sound esoteric, it is not. We're talking about quantum circuits, but also probabilistic graphical models that are interesting in the context of generative modeling and unsupervised learning. So settings that directly arise from the machine learning um, context. And the, the paper here I'm, I'm, I'm referring to that was also um, accepted at NeurIP. So that's a machine learning conference. So that's something that also the machine learning people um, would, find, would find interesting. So the question at the heart of the matter is, how can you represent probability distributions as tensor networks? And if you do so, how many parameters do you need and what overheads do you need in, 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 in doing so? And um, that's a tensor network. For those of you um, who have not seen tensor networks before, now you have. It's a network of tensors. Okay, so, um, well, it's not entirely serious, but uh, yeah, it's, in this picture, a tensor would be like a box. And, and if two boxes are connected, you would have an edge. That means you sum over joint index and if you crunch it together, it's called contraction, would rise, would rise to the value at the open indices. That's enormously important in condensed matter physics, in probability theory, in, in whatnot, in mathematical modeling. It's an extremely powerful concept. You just have a few numbers, like linearly many numbers to represent some state. The, these guys here, these linear guys are called matrix product states in the physics literature, also called many paper states for good reasons. I mean, uh, uh, they're also called tensor trains in the mathematical literature. They're called finitely correlated states in the mathematical physics literature. They're all the same. And the reason why there's so many names and conventions is because they've been reinvented so many times. And they, they supernaturally appear also in the context of hidden Markov models. That's a way of writing a hidden Markov model. If you're interested, ask me about it. And um, in probabilistic modeling, they, they give, immediately give rise to settings of this kind. Now, how can you represent a probability distribution as a matrix product state of this kind? One obvious way of doing that is you take tensors and you put in only non-negative real numbers. And then you crunch them together. And at the end of the day, you will have non-negative real numbers. Very funny, so they could interpret them as a probability distribution upon normalization. So if the entries are non-negative reals, then you have a tensor train slash matrix product state representation of a probability distribution. Great, that's the first one. You can also take other real numbers that you happen to fine tune in a way so that the guy that's coming out at the end of the day is still a probability distribution, you can. Or you could even take complex numbers that are so fine-tuned so that at the end of the day, you will still get positive reals at the end so that you still get a probability distribution coming out. So these are already three ways of writing probability distributions in terms of tensor networks. And all three have been used much in the, in the literature. These are equipped with huge bodies of literature. Each. It's the first family. The second family may look esoteric, but for the, it's called Born Machine, for the more physically inclined people, this is just basically the density operator of a pure state. If it's a pure state, you have the, 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 the cat and the bra, so to say, the vector and the dual vector, you put, put them together, that's the density operator. It's a pure density operator. Um, they arise extremely naturally naturally slash they are short quantum circuits in the sense if, if you have complex parameters if you have a short quantum circuit run on some qubits you can contract this circuit as a tensor network and upon measurement at the end of the day this is precisely what you get so even this if this 
this framework and this notation with box and so on may look funny and so on. This is nothing but one reading of a short quantum circuit that you run and then you make measurements, it's called the Bohr machine, and then you get outcome, you get data, it's a bit like a boson sampling type setting where you get outcomes at the end of the day upon something. That's the Bohr machine. And again, you can do it over some field, over reals, over complex numbers and, and positive numbers. And the third reading is what is called a locally purified state that would be called a, uh, well, a, a strictly positive density operator in the condensed matter literature, locally purified state in the mathematics literature. It is what it is. That's an extra bond. That's, bond. That's an extra bond between the, the guys in the middle, um, the, the locally uh, purified purified rank that's common when you kind of describe mass equations in quantum physics in, in condensed matter, for example. So this again has been reinvented many times in, in, in many different literatures. That's a locally purified state that again would work for reals, like non-negative reals, reals, and, and, and complex numbers. So these are all different ways of representing probability distributions that have been used in each big literatures and deeply connecting to short quantum circuits because it's really also about what short circuits can represent upon measurement and, and what the expensive power is at the end of the day. So this is an, an, an important question. And the question is, what is the expensive power and what, what can they do? How are these different pictures connected? And um, how does it work? And of course, all of these representations are complete in the sense that we can write an arbitrary probability distribution in, in these terms, but there can be immense overheads of going from one picture to the other. So the question is, at what overhead can you take one form and represent this one form in terms of the other? That's basically at, at, at stake. And interestingly, for this problem, one can really hammer this problem down in all generality and, and in everything you ever wanted to know about this or, or, or not of this problem. And what this, in here we joined forces with our friends in, in Garching and in, in Ignacio Sirac's um, team, where we looked at, started off looking at, at the matrix case and proved new theorems on matrices, but also looked into the literature and you will not believe how many ranks there are in the literature. Like positive semi-definite rank, non-negative rank. There is really a lot of ranks in the, in, in, in the literature and we came up and also proved new statements of, of ranks and asked how much overhead you need to know to have to go from one picture to, to, to the other. There's also a question mark in this diagram, which relates to the hardest matrix problem I've related, I've seen in my life. It's still open. I'm happy to share this if you want to see a, a matrix problem that is so hard that several people looked at for several months and could not make, make, make progress. Yeah. Anyway, so this uh, table here is, is of the, is, has to be read, meaning you have like one representation on the left, like a TT rank, and then on the right hand side, you would see in the column side, you would see at what overhead you can make another representation. And if there's a square, you would say you can get away with a square overhead. And if there's a no, it means there's no functional overhead, meaning this can be at an exponential or an unbounded overhead to go from one to the other, which is strange, but they can be in unbounded overheads. And some of these guys can be rather trivial, meaning if you go from uh, from the TT rank to the Born rank, you get a square because you take the vector and you just double it, and then it's pretty clear that you get a square, a square over it. Um, and these are statements on matrices. The interesting bit, this can be uplifted to statements for arbitrary system sizes that again applies also to quantum circuits in the mentioned in the mentioned sense. And there's really very strange surprises coming up. One thing is already funny is that using complex numbers to represent stuff over real tensors can lead to an arbitrary large reduction in the number of parameters unbounded in an unbounded fashion of the setting. You have some probability distribution that's real, obviously, and you represent it in terms of reals, but by going complex, you can have an unbounded reduction of parameters, even though the guy you are representing is real. It's kind of weird. Anyway, that's, that's uh, one of the statements, one of the statements we have. Also, the locally purified states, these pure state density operators, I don't know, these um, positive density operators, as I put them, they're probably better than any of the other representations 
and again, often in an unbounded fashion. So there's one, one representation to rule them all so that by using this representation, you get an unbounded or exponentially better representation of probability distributions compared to other things that are used in the literature, including the short variational quantum circuits. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And this we, this we found, and we also matched this with numerical learning algorithms, seeing that this is not just some esoteric insight, but this really governs the performance of practical uh, machine learning algorithms and also representing uh, situations of quantum circuits, representing born machines. That's, that, that it really matters how you represent things and you can make quantitative statements, how you represent distributions in a fashion. And this matters, you get exponentially large overheads. So the lesson of the second proof pocket is we need understandings of what things can do. We want to have an assessment of the expressive power. This can lead to surprises, but we need more of that. This is more like an invitation. We had like one problem where we could hammer down a problem once and for all in all beauty and glory. That's nice. And we are super happy about this. And this was like nicely received in, in, in several communities. But of course, you need more than of that type. Like what can final round Quawa do? What's there in store? What, what can they do? What can they represent? What's, what do structured short circuits represent? Where there's extra structure, I mean, maybe not Clifford structure, but something. What can you do with short quantum circuits? And we need to have an answer on this question of some type to make progress to see what is in store for near term computing. Which brings me to the last proof pocket because I promised to be in time, so I better do that. Um, on certified quantum advantages. There's very little I need to say about quantum advantages or supremacy with random circuits in these days, I guess. I mean, the, the famous Google experiment made so much, uh, made, uh, created so much attention, it's absolutely unbelievable. There was a time when I was actually in, 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 in LA this was funny. I, mean, I also was visiting the Google Labs at, the, at that time, but it was kind of cute to see that absolutely every Uber driver and every free newspaper of every shopping mall would have um, like supremacy on the title. It's like ubiquitous as the topic, the talk of town in LA. Unbelievable. Anyway, um, and well, you know what this is about? It's like not so much about practical algorithms of practical problem solving, but it's on near-term devices, just showing that there's some quantum advantage of a complexity with the type over classical computers, no matter what. And um, the problems considered are mostly sampling problems where the upshot is that one can do certain sampling algorithms like with, with random circuits or so, which you can do in the lab, or which also the Google people have done in the lab, it's a beautiful setting with the point that one can, with brutal effort, but one can run the circuit on a quantum computer, but one cannot sample from the same distribution on a classical computer. So it's a sampling problem that's hard to approximate on classical computers, or more precisely put, one cannot um, find a classical algorithm that spits samples out up to a constant error in the total variation distance, unless one accepts a um, collapse of the polynomial hierarchy to the third level, but that's deemed highly implausible. So you cannot spit out samples that are close to the quantum scheme. It's not very practical, but it's a setting where you have a kind of an, an, a proven quantum advantage over a classical computer. That's great. Now, assume we have that, can we efficiently black box verify the entire scheme based on sampling. And what does that mean? I mean, at the end of the day, you want to see, has the scheme worked out? Have, has the scheme done what it should have done? So that means for a sampling scheme, when you look at data alone, you go into the lab, you produce lots of data, and you look at the data, and if the data are right, you say, wonderful, my data are right. And if the data are wrong, you say, oh dear, the data are too noisy, they are wrong. That's a black box verification. Good data is good, bad data is bad. Yeah. Um, slightly more pedantically put, like a black box certification test with some sample complexity would be a test that takes the data, 
And in the fixture setting of being precisely right, it would accept this with the probability of like say larger than two thirds or so. But if the deviation is larger than epsilon in the total variation distance, then the test would, um, well, there should be one third, should accept with the probability is smaller than one third or so. And the, the test is sample efficient if because life's short, if it only takes polynomially many samples because you just, that's all you can ever do. So it's just a test saying if the data are right, green light, if the data are not so right, if they're too noisy, you would say they're, they're, they're not right. So can you black box verify such settings? Now the machinery behind this is kind of, um, kind of cute. I mean, uh, let's, uh, let's keep this short. Um, there is surely distribution that can black box verify if they're rather peaked. Um, the, the proof tool that enters here is maybe the funniest norm I've seen in my entire life. That's the P minus epsilon minus max two thirds norm, which is you take a distribution, you chop off the largest element, you chop off the tail summed up to epsilon in the lower end, and then you take the Renyi two thirds norm. And this dude decides everything. You cannot make this up. Anyway, using this machinery, building on work by the Violin brothers, um, you can find whether you go into the lab, do some quantum supremacy experiments, and you say, can I, from the samples alone, verify that I've done the right thing or, or not? And cutely, in boson sampling, IQP circuits, random circuits, they cannot be black box verified from polynomial many samples, even if you grant a, an inefficient classical post processing. So that gives rise to an interesting and somewhat ironic situation that you cannot black box verify the correctness of a quantum sampling scheme of that type. It's kind of funny, but um, well, you would have to take too many data just by looking at polynomial many data, you can never come to the conclusion that you, that you have kind of black box verified. And this. However, there's some last twist to the story. That's my last point I want to make before meditating. There are quantum advantage scheme, quantum supremacy schemes with the property that you don't have a short circuit, but you have a unit depth circuit or two layer circuit. Okay, not long, it's one layer of circuits of gates that are even commuting. That's borderline classical, borderline depth in 2D. You take a product input, you just apply one unit depth layer of commuting gates. And that's really epsilon classical, away from classical. And you make a measurement, just an ID measurement at the end of the day. You just measure, you sample it out. With a proven hardness claim up to constant errors in the total variation distance. It gives rise to a quantum supremacy scheme of this type. But with the extra nice feature that by taking data that are very similar than the sampling itself, but taking the like Pauli X and Z data, you can go into the lab, take data, and if the noise levels are too high, the machine would say, oh dear, my noise levels are too high, I have to give up. But if the noise levels are low enough, if, or if, the, if one takes data and the green light goes on, the green light would not say, oh, it's kind of cute, it's kind of working, or the noise levels are kind of low, or it's kind of good. But the number you get from the data bound the very same quantity that goes into the complexity theoretic proof that shows the hardness of the scheme. You can really bound the, the, the total variation distance. So you can go into the lab and if the green light goes on, it can be efficiently verified with quantum detectors. They don't have to be perfect. They have to be good, but not perfect. So that if the approval goes on, you say, I'm right. It's not just building trust in the device. It's not just saying, oh, it's kind of, it's cute, it's good. But by taking this data, you can say, I have run the scheme. I have, I am in the re regime of a quantum advantage. I have done the setting. They say, oh, that's wonderful. What is it? What's the outcome? And you say, I don't know, you have to go into the lab. This test is only saying you are right, but it's not saying what the outcome is. You still have to do the experiment. Well, it's even philosophically interesting that you can verify the correctness of something 
you cannot really in all detail predict. I mean, this test saying, I have the right state, I have the right setting, but then you still have to do the sampling and, 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 and so on. It's kind of philosophically cute to see that knowing to be right is less than, than uh, producing samples. You say, I'm right, but what is it? I don't know, but I'm right. Yeah, and this works with unit depth circuits where you still get a quantum advantage in, 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 the, in the sense so that shows that unit depth circuits may be very unexpressive in the sense of our second proof pocket, but one can still do something quantum and you can get a quantum advantage, a quantum supremacy setting by just running a circuit once, a thin one unit depth layer and you do it with the additional feature that you can go into the lab, you can take data and you can say, I'm right. You cannot predict things, but you say, I'm right. And then taking data, you get the samples from the supremacy scheme. So the lesson, some quantum advantage schemes can be even efficiently certified with quantum detectors. You can say, I'm right, even though if you cannot give samples of that kind, but you can certify quantum advantage settings with quantum detectors. Which brings me to the end of the talk, 50 minutes into the talk. I, I um, promised to be in time. So this talk was on near-term quantum computing. So pre-universal, not this glorious short class for tolerant quantum computers that would, we would all love to have, but on near-term quantum computers, computers that exist, that might exist soon, so what's on the plate now, which for good reasons is attracting a lot of attention. Now this is like, a field in a gold rush state where there's a new idea coming out any day. I think that's not an over exaggeration. And there is an enormous body of heuristic improvement or in many ways there's huge software developed like at Zapata along these lines. Um, that's extremely exciting and still in the medium term, the question that's on the plate is good, but how far does this go with near-term computing? What can we do with it ultimately? What's the power of near-term computing? That's the question on, on, the, on, the, on the plate. We see this guy, here's our little small state computer, but you want to let it grow and, and, and flourish. So we want to water it nicely and make sure it, it goes into the, right, into the right direction. So in this talk, we kind of meditated on the question whether one can take steps to get a kind of rigorous quantitative understanding, not of the full Monty, but using the small quantum computer, look at key building blocks and see what one can do with it, how to precisely understand it at hand of the key building blocks that we have. And we've been successful in three ways. There were like three um, readings of this. There's others, but the first building block, the first uh, proof pocket was <clears throat> there's some lab, you have control knobs. You have to pick control knobs. You have to write some software. And the question is, how do I best make use of the data I have? How do I improve my setting? How can I improve gradient-based methods at the end of the day? And what we say is, wait, take the same data, take the same everything, boom, 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 shoot at the setting, cowboy-like, take the data and do something with it. And you can still get out a method that's way more efficient, practically speaking, at the same time having theorems, having recovery guarantees at hand. I think this is a healthy mindset. This is not the end of the road. I'm not saying that, but it's a healthy mindset. And so also cute to see that Zapata, for example, has already incorporated that in, in, in their software just because it's just too practical um, not to use it. This was the first setting. You have knobs. How can I pick the knobs? That's the first question in near-term computing. Second question is, you have knobs, what can these knobs do? What is in store? What's the expressive power of circuits? If they're not super deep, stuff is noisy. The, the, the average gate fidelities of the gates is, is bad, so there's, you cannot think of very deep circuits. They're shallow, they are, they're noisy. So what can you do with short circuits, with small circuits? What is their, their power? And more precisely, what is the expressive power of, of these circuits? We need urgently more statements of that kind. So we looked at this question in a, in a very pedantic fashion, maybe in a very German fashion, um, in uh, kind of hammering down one reading of the problem in, in, in all glory and detail, in the question of how to get probability distributions out. But this gives a mindset and a machinery to think 
more deeply about this problem. And I think tensor networks give a machinery to go further, but there's more practical questions coming out of like, what can Quava do? What can variational quantum eigensolvers do? Like how many knobs do we need? How can we use them? What can we do with small quantum circuits? We need to understand this. And the third question was if circuits are not only small, but if they're like shallow, what can we do with them? And at first sight, you think a single layer circuit is good for nothing. I mean, you have a, you have a product state, you have a compute, commuting gate, there's no entanglement in the system. It's like, it's a almost classical state. There's nothing in it. Yeah, in a way, yes. It's still good enough to get a provable quantum advantage, to get a quantum supremacy scheme, and one that's even with quantum detectors, and so not in a device independent setting, but with quantum detectors, verifiable in the sense you can take data and you can say, I have taken data efficiently and you can say, I'm right. What is it? I don't know, but I'm right. And with this, I'm coming to the end of my talk and I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have. Thanks so very much for your attention. Great. Oh. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, um, Jens, virtual club uh, from, from the other end of the world. Uh, I think there are a few questions. Um, um, what I recommend is we take a few and then, um, where are you? Okay. Um, I, I go to the chats. There's oh. one in the chat by Super Nutana Silk. Um, Super is actually a PhD student in my group. Can you see the chat? No, it's actually sent it to me only. So let me ah. put it so you can see it as well. Okay. Uh, or I can just uh, say it, but it's easy if you want to see. Um, in stochastic gradient descent, does it work for any better circuit, in particular for hardware efficient circuit where it has been shown to have barren plateaus? How does the stochastic gradient descent fit into this context? Ah, wonderful question. Yes. yes um, so I so to ask, yeah. the, the short answer, well, I, I think, yes, yes, I don't know. Okay. Slightly longer answer is um, it does work for an arbitrary circuit. So what it does is give them some, le well, I mean, in principle, it works for an arbitrary circuit. So we have a machinery to let this work for an arbitrary circuit. So that's laid out. We have an in detailed um, understanding of how it works super precisely with a theorem each in like the variation quantum eigensolver setting in the quantum approximate optimization setting and in a nonlinear function machine learning setting. That said, the same machinery would work for an arbitrary circuit with funny topologies. There might be a physics non-agnostic setting where you have like some sort of connectivity pattern, think of a superconducting device where you don't want to say, ah, I want to have gates all over the place, but you have the gates that you have, right? Yes, it works in all these settings um, in principle. Now, for hardware efficient circuit variation, it's been shown that you have barren plateaus. Yes. Maybe for well, everyone, barren the... plateau is a plateau that's barren, so it's like a it's There's no direction to, yeah, it's too flat. Where you are, it's like a, you have a desert, you want to go downhill and it's looking flat everywhere. So you say, oh shit, where do I go? I mean, it's flat. And there have been nice work by the Google team saying that there are some settings where it's very likely to end up in a setting where the, 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 the gradients are exponentially small. So what do we do? Most of the time, basically, you end up Even there. Most of the time. And there's also ways, and we are working on them. They have a PhD student working on that. But that's different. And this is, I think, a, really a bit of a different question in the sense that not only do we have efficient, like by order of magnitude, more efficient practical methods of finding the best local optimum, we even have a proof that it will work to find the best local optimum. That's what we answer, that's our pocket. Having said that, when there's no optimum nearby, there's also tools, but these are different and I've not spoken about them. So what I've said is, if there's a way of going downhill, we have a highly efficient use of going downhill using the same experimentally feasible data. Yeah? If there's no way of going downhill, there is ways of thinking about them, but 
that's not what the talk was about. Um, does it help? And um, the short answer to what I've not talked about, of course, stochasticity does help. I mean, at the end of the day, you will have to sample out the manifolds you have. But that's kind of sampling out for a bit of a different reason. Yeah. In, in the wider context, to give a broader perspective, I think, and that's, I mean, that's highly um, relevant also. So they're kind of cute in, in the sense that um, many people think about these things that you get data and you say, what do we do with the data? And you should be smart. I mean, there's also a bit of a signal processing thing. You, you have your control landscape, you've not, what to do, what, what do you do with the data and what advice do you give? And people more and more learn that you should be smart with the data. And that's the, the bigger context. Okay, one more question. Oh, this is a general question. Uh, uh, what would be the first step for beginners to start research in the field of quantum cryptography? Well, uh, I think this is from a non-specialist audience. If you want to take it, uh, how to start learning quantum cryptography if you are a beginner? To learn quantum, I mean, to use this for quantum cryptography? Or I think it's probably from a non-specialist. Uh, I would say, you know, get get Nissen and Chuang book or read um, BB84 and E91 papers. It depends what your background is. Niha Sharma. Well, if the question is, um, how do I learn quantum crypto? Well, there's loads of good texts. I mean, this yeah. field started a long time ago in 84, as we all know. And um, there's good textbooks on that. Um, Nielsen Schwang is a good, 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 good read and so on. Uh, but if, I, I'm not sure whether how this question was precisely meant. If the question was meant in the context of my talk, there is something interesting to be said about uh, this. Namely, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't specify. It just says, what should be the first step for beginners to, to start research in field of quantum cryptography? So I think it's, it's a general, it's for beginners. I don't know. And then I say one sentence anyway, because I think it's a cute idea to make use of quantum circuits and um, For cryptography, yeah. Use these circuits to do something. That's this kind of um, uh, quantum AD design idea. We do, did this for um, metrology. It's highly complicated mm. to get good, good sources, good probes, and you say, oh, wait, how do I do it? It's also exponentially inefficient. And say, great, I use a quantum computer to do it. There was just one paper out by the, um, by the Sydney gang who thinks about quantum error correcting mm, codes mm. in this fashion. There was a paper by Alan Asperikusik, also every on the same day. We didn't talk. I mean, we do talk, but not about this. Um, and uh, who thought about, thinks about using a quantum computer to design quantum simulators. And you can also use quantum mm, computers yeah, this to design work, yeah. uh, quantum uh, key distribution schemes. So yes. So if that was your question, this is a cute question. And we should think about this. If it was just meant as a general advice, just Google it. I mean, even the Wikipedia article. Yes, it's a good study. One more question from Jiravat. Uh, it's a postdoc in my group. I see his hand is raised. Jiravat, you want to type or unmute? Or just unmute and, and ask it? Hello? Jiravat, are you there? You have your hand. Is there a question? Johan. Oh, hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hi, yes. James. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. I I really interested in the uh, efficient certification part on the two D uh, lattice at the end. Yeah. So I I read the paper. Um, although I I couldn't understand that part. So so it's a good opportunity for me to ask you here. Uh, so if I understand correctly, um, this uh, 2D icing model, they map to a random circuit in some limits, right? And, and the random circuit cannot be efficiently certified, but somehow this 2D icing can be efficiently certified. So I'm not sure what I am missing here. Oh, that's not so bad. I think you're missing only epsilon. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. So the, the, the one line uh, idea of this is, well, you want to make the physics as simple as possible. I want to put the misery and the pain to the theorists, basically, in this case, us. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're, you're basically right. It's a scheme of product state. You do a one depth circuit and you measure. There's no adaption, no gates. Well, only the, you can see this as a Hamiltonian evolution under an easy Hamiltonian. So there's no gates, no nothing, no control, no random circuits, whatever. Mm. Okay, only that the, the statistics that you get out at the end of the day 
is the same statistics as if you had done a scheme of measurement-based quantum computing with mm. measurement in the XY plane, mm -hmm. which in turn is a kind of 2D measurement-based scheme, which is equivalent, mathematically speaking, to a quantum circuit where you see where one axis is time, the other one is space, where you do random gates to get the output at the end, at the end of the day. Okay? Mm. So this, this circuit is post BQP complete. So it's a post selected quantum computer mm -hmm. the, by the gates you get. You get um, T gates and, and, and Hadamard gates and so on. So by this circuit, you get a, a post BQP circuit. Okay? And um, you're not implementing the circuit. It's not in the lab, it's only in your head. It's just the statistics you get out at the end of the day is the same as in our setting where you just have hum some Hamiltonian evolution and you just measure out at the end of the day. That's a cute step. There's a random circuit but you're not doing it. It's not in the physics, it's just in the mathematical equivalence in the sense that the statistics, the statistics you get at one point is the same as if you had done a quantum circuit, but you're not doing it. Right. That's the first part. The second part is, oh, how do I certify the state? But that's rather trivial. It's rather interesting that you can do it um, in this context, which is you take measurements um, and um, by measurement, by me X and Z measurements alone, you can just certify the correctness of the state. Okay. Because the state is close to being trivial. It's a, wow, I mean, it's, it's a product state conjugated with a one unit depth circuit. So if you want, it's a PEPS of one dimension two, if you are yeah. a tensor network part. If not, it's just a very simple ground state of Hamiltonian. You just measure out the Hamiltonian terms. So to make measurements and to efficiently certify that the state is right, mm -hmm. very easy. Get very strong Jens, uh, Jens, um, let me, sorry, uh, because we're still recording, I think it might be good point to take the more specialized questions afterwards, especially for my group. If you have, if you have 10, 15 minutes, we'd love to pick your brain. We have some recent results to bounce of you as well on this supremacy and certification business accessibility using analog circuits and so on. There is one more question from the audience that I would like to bring up um, yeah. from uh, uh, SUDD, um, I just put it on the chat. Uh, it's, it's about tensor network. This tensor network method is in probability distribution. How does the structure of the tensor network affect the results? I noticed in your slide is one dimensional MPS for two te D tensor networks such as PEPS. Is it possible oh. to be applied to this decision? It's a cute question. Um, feel invited to collaborate. Send me a line. Um, that's super interesting. I mean, we've started to think about this it very much changes everything, but it's not easy. Of course, there's other things on top. I mean, the contraction problem is tricky, right? There's a, a sharpie hard problem on top. It's not easy, but um, making steps along these lines would be interesting. You've taken some steps in the hierarchical context, like in the tree context, mm. um, which, is kind of, which is kind of cute. One more question from the audience. I, I, I paste it now to the global chat. From a DT, yeah. Can tensor networks like MPS or MERA be used to represent random quantum circuits or say unitary T designs? What's the depth of such circuits? Can tensor networks like MPS or MERA can be used to represent random circuits or unitary T designs? You yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, like an MPS is a circuit. In fact, it's a linear circuit. You have a line, one line, and then if you apply unitary gates to one and two, two and three. Um, three and four, and do, 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 you go to once. That's a highly structured circuit. It gives an MPS. If these guys are random, it gives rise to a random MPS. It's a very nice probability measure. Mira, same thing. You apply gates, use their gates in a hierarchical fashion. You have a top guy, you have a two leg guy, do, 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 you go down. And um, then um, you get. Uh, you get a state out. If this guy is random, you get a random state out. We even in, 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 in one, one paper on two entangled to be useful. It's a bit of a joke title, but it was a cute paper where we have, have, have an appendix where we did look at a random mirror in the sense. We'd have the kind of a tree, picked random unitaries and found that these gives are the states that are too entangled to be useful. Okay. Unitary designs, sure, but that means they have to be deeper. Mm. Yeah, indeed. I mean, well, you know, well, I mean, the random circuits give rise to unitary designs and what's the depth? So for MPS, it's linear depth, mirror, log depth, unitary designs, um, 
Oh, short. We just had a paper out that shows that um, you can get away with Clifford's and a constant number of non-Clifford operations. Very an excellent question. Good. Any other questions? Anybody else wants to ask something? If not, let's thank um, yes again Thanks. and thank everybody for joining again in this uh, session. See you next week with, um, I think the talk will be from JQI, an experimentalist this time, Chris Monroe group. And take care, everybody. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the interest. Thanks, Wonderful. everything. Thanks for doing this over a very